Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets, prophesied following the exile, after they had returned from the exile, reminding them to remember the law, prophesying of the day of the Lord that would come, that would be a great day for those who were righteous, a day of punishment for those who were evil, pointed out to those who were righteous that the Son of Righteousness would rise. He talked about the coming of John that would be the forerunner to the Messiah. In the meantime, he cautioned them to remember the law of Moses. A lot of sermons are preached concerning the rest, restoring of the New Testament church. Restore the ancient order. Go back to the Bible, we say. We're saying, in effect, remember the law. Not the law of Moses, but the law that God has given in his New Testament for the church. When we discuss this subject, we stress the marks of identity of the church that's found in the Bible. We talk about its origin, about its undenominational nature, we talk about the terms of membership, the organization, the worship, all of those things. And all of those things are fundamental and they are extremely important. They are a part of going back to God's word and to the law, if you please. And it's still true that one mark of difference makes a counterfeit. But I wonder if we've forgotten something. I wonder if we are leaving something out. How often do we stress the spirit of New Testament Christianity? Have we become so concerned with the law, and the letter of the law, that we've forgotten the spirit? Malachi said, remember the law of Moses. The law of Moses was that which was given to the Jews. It was that set of instructions that were given to the Jews to follow in their time. Even they became so caught up in the letter of the law, so to speak, that by Jesus' time there was a problem. And Jesus said, you keep the law, you're tithing men and anise and coming and all those things, but you're neglecting some of the weightier things, like judgment mercy and some of those things. Have we become so concerned with the outward structure that we've neglected the inward spirit of the church? Now please don't interpret me to mean that law and structure are not vital. They are. It's extremely important that we obey the commandments. John 14 verse 15. It's extremely important that we have correctly taught that one who ignores the New Testament commands lacks the Spirit of Christ. It's extremely important that we understand the origin of the church, the structure of the church, the organization, the authority, and all of those things. All of those things are extremely important. I'm not taking anything away from that. But I'm saying that sometimes we've restored those things and ignored the spirit of Christianity and the New Testament. And without the spirit of Christ, Paul said we're none of his. So let's look at the spirit of those early Christians for a little bit. We're doing something today that all the preaching books and homiletics teachers tell you you're not supposed to do. We've taken Malachi 4 and we're going to leave it and not come back to it. We've jumped off from that and going to something else. And I want to look at the spirit of New Testament Christianity. What did the indwelling spirit of Christ motivate those people to do in their service in the church that was built on the name of Jesus Christ? In the first place, they practiced religion with fervent intensity. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, those early Christians, of them it was said that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were united in one body. They loved one another fervently with a love that transcends all race and social barriers. 
They were concerned about one another. They had all things common, Acts 4, verses 34 and 35. None of them said that he had anything that was his own, but they had all things common, and everyone that had a need had that need cared for. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and following, we read of the uh, church in Macedonia. It says, Brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the churches of Macedonia, that in a, a great ordeal of affliction their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. And he goes on to describe how that they provided for the needs of others in Jerusalem and other places who were, uh, who were strapped with famine and other things. And so they cared for one another. They were intent in what they believed. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, he, Paul said that even though I be poured out as a drink offering, I will urge you to do the same. I'll rejoice and urge you to do the same. And so they were a people who were intense. They were a people who rejoiced in their religion. They were a people who were happy to be Christians. And they were happy to share with one another in their needs. So intense was their practice of Christianity that they rejoiced in their suffering. And there was a lot of suffering that went on among Christians at that time. They were not too concerned about material things. Importance was not in what they had, but in what they were. Have we restored that to the New Testament church? Have we restored that kind of intensity? We've, we've got the structure. We have the organization right. We have the worship acts right. We have all of these things that are important, that are right. But what about that intensity? What about that feeling for one another? What about that caring for one another? What about the intensity, the zeal that we have in that respect? I believe the explanation for that spirit is faith. They were people of great faith. They were able to rejoice because of the great faith that they possessed in God's taking care of them and God's providing for them. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed a righteousness from faith unto faith, but the righteous shall live by faith. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, he said again that the righteous shall live by faith. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, It's no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I live, that I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith. That is in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. They believed God because... They believed that God became man in Christ. And they believed that in doing that, that Christ came to provide for their welfare, for their well-being, for their salvation, if you please. And that faith led them to a spirit of intensity, a spirit of zeal. Oh, they did things right. They had the structure correct. They did those things that were necessary. They did those things correctly. But they did it with a spirit of love and zeal and excitement and joy. Somehow I get the picture of the church in the first century when they came together to worship. I get the picture in my mind of a people who come together and they're all smiles and they're happy and they're rejoicing together. They sing with intensity. They sing with fervency. They worship with fervency, their prayers are poured out with intent from the heart, with intent from the heart. And I see a people who laughed a lot. In spite of the fact that they were under severe persecution. And too many times today, when we come together to worship, as those of us who stand up here and look out at you, we see faces that are long and sad. And we see people that are fidgety and who don't want to be still for at least an hour. 
to as quickly as they possibly can when the amen is said they're gone. They don't have much to do with anybody else. Have we lost the New Testament Christianity in that? They believe, those people believe that Christ was an example that they should follow even in the face of suffering. Peter said he left us an example that we should follow any steps. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Certainly we're to do that in every phase of life, but Peter's talking about in the, in the aspect of suffering. Church was under persecution. Jesus was persecuted more severely than any of them ever thought about being persecuted and that certainly we will never think about. And yet he said we should follow in, their, in his steps, even in the face of that kind of persecution. The Spirit of New Testament Christianity is following Christ and faith gives us the power to do that. There are many facets of true faith. You know, when we look at sunlight, we see but one ray of sun. But in a prism, we see all of the different colors of the sun. Faith is a lot more than believing facts. That's part of it. That's important. It's important that we believe that God is, that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's important. Without faith, it's impossible to be well-pleasing unto him, but we must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But there's more to it than that. Certainly that's a beginning place. But faith, according to Thayer, is used especially on the faith by which a man embraces Jesus. That is a conviction full of joyful trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God and conjoined with obedience. So faith has at least three aspects. It has conviction. On the day of Pentecost when Peter preached the fact that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was crucified by them, that he was raised from the dead, that God had made him both Lord and Christ, the Bible says that they were convicted. They were pricked in their hearts, the King James Version says. They were convicted in their hearts. The second is trust. Those same people trusted that and they said, what shall we do? And the third aspect is obedience. They were told to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 38 and verse 41 says that as many as received the word were baptized and there were added to them about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 people that day had faith. Faith that convicted them, faith that they trusted, in which they trusted, and faith that caused them to obey the commands that were given. Faith gives us the power for the spirit of Christianity. There are four great attributes that are included in faith. One is the courage of convictions. It's one thing to be convicted. It's another thing to have the courage of those convictions. Conviction, of course, equals the claims of Jesus' demand for a decision. Uh, the idea that not some half-hearted, unemotional recognition, but real conviction, and then a standing up for that conviction. Jesus was unique, is unique. He's the only Son begotten of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one to rise from the dead, not to be, not to die again. He's the only son who was perfect in all his ways. The son of God, risen from the dead, made Lord in Christ, Peter said. Those people of that day, and especially the apostles, were men of courage who obeyed God in spite of persecutions. They taught the early church to obey God in spite of persecution, to stand for the convictions that they had. The first step is conviction. 
We can't really have Christ without that conviction. <laughs> courage was extended to those early Christians, and the courage of our convictions must extend to us as well. Those who no longer attend worship have lost faith. Those who refuse the gospel lack faith. They lack conviction. So we must have the courage to speak, even when our speaking is unpopular. We are to preach the whole counsel of God. It's easier sometimes to keep silent. Sometimes baptism is a controversy, and it's easier just not talk about it. We need to talk about service. We need to talk about immorality. All of those things are unpopular, but they're things of which we must be convicted and convictions for which we must stand if we're to restore the spirit of New Testament Christianity. Second phase of faith is communion. This goes beyond conviction and leads one to fellowship and communion with the Lord. I must know Christ as I would know a friend or a loved one. It's one thing to know about him, to know that he is, to know about him, but to know him is more than knowing facts. There are two kinds of knowledge. There's the knowledge of facts, and then there's the knowing of a person. Every once in a while, somebody will ask me, do you know such and such a person? And I may know of that person. I may know his name. I might know him when I see him, but I don't really know him at all. To know someone means to have an intimate relationship with them. I know Chet Walker. I've been around him for 20 years and off and on and been around him enough that I know something of his character and the qualities of his life. I know him. If we're talking about someone around town, I may know them by name, I may know them by sight, but I don't know anything about them. I don't know them at all. There are too many people, even those who are members of the church today, who do not know Jesus. They know about him, they know the facts of his life and his death and all of that, but they don't really know him. They not have, have not developed an intimate relationship with him. That means that we enter a relationship that is a relationship of love and friendship and oneness and communion, not only with Christ, but with each other as well. To know Christ is for him to be a part of my life, whatever it is that I do and wherever it is that I go. John 17, verse 3, the Bible says, This is life eternal, that they should know thee, the only true God, and him whom thou didst send, even Jesus Christ. Hebrews 8, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says that you know him as God and Father, intimate relationship. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, I know him whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Saving faith is to know Christ as a person, to experience the power in our lives and to live in fellowship and communion with him. The third aspect of faith is commitment. Commitment. Oh, that's lacking in a lot of our lives, isn't it? Commitment. If I know Christ, then I'll, consecrate it, I'll be consecrated and committed my life to him. Zeal. If committed, a lot of contrast would disappear. There's zeal as opposed to indifference. We plead for zeal. But on an ordinary Sunday, half of those who are in worship on Sunday morning won't be back Sunday night. Fewer will be present on Wednesday night. If we have special meetings during the week, even fewer show up. Zeal is missing somewhere in that. We preach the church first, and we say we ought to put the church first, but somehow the church runs a very poor third or fourth. 
a lot of times behind jobs and families and pleasures, maybe other things. Those early Christians faced even death in order to worship. Every opportunity that came to them, they worshiped even in the face of severe persecution. Daily and house to house, they worshiped both publicly and from house to house. Their zeal led them to be soul winners. They went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8, verse 4, so that within a, a very short time, the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven, Colossians 1, verse 23. Today, those who make those kinds of efforts are exceptions. And a great asset, I might add, to any congregation in which they reside and yet there's never a time, there was never a time when there was a greater need for zeal in spreading the gospel than right now. It takes zeal and enthusiasm. A few years ago, Dr. Henry Smith Leeper of the American Bible Society compiled some statistics. And these are a little bit old, and so some of the numbers may be a little bit different. But he said, let's put together a theoretical town of a thousand people and we'll let that thousand people represent the world each nation color religion represented in the same proportion as it is in the world today he says of that thousand there would be 60 americans the other 940 persons would represent the rest of the world those 60 Americans would have half of the income of the entire town. About 330 people would be classified as Christians in the broadest possible sense. 230 of these would be Catholics. There would be at least 80 who would follow some form of pagan, heathen religion, perhaps Muslim. There would be 303 white people, 697 non-white. Half of the thousand people would never have heard of Jesus Christ or what he taught, but more than half would have heard of various atheistic philosophies. The 60 Americans in our town would have an average life expectancy of 70 years. Each would own at least 15 times as many possessions as the other 940 people. The 940 would have life expectancy of less than 40 years, and most of them would go to bed hungry most nights. The American families would be spending an average of $850 per year on military defense and less than $4 a year to share their religious faith with their neighbors in the community. If a handful of Christians lived in such a town, think of what a challenge they would face. And he goes on to point out that we do indeed face such a challenge in the world in which we live today. For those statistics are pretty true to form in our world today. As there are many, many people, more and more people, who are accepting the Muslim way of life and other heathen philosophies. While the church is not showing a lot of growth. There'd be the contrast of spirituality as opposed to materialism. Worldliness is a major problem in our society. Many forms that once were not tolerated are now overlooked. Drinking and pride and sexual sins and so on often are glossed over, overlooked. We've changed the names of some of them rather than to call them sins. And then there's sacrifice as opposed to selfishness. Time, talent, money, whatever it is, often we have become very selfish with. The fourth aspect of this faith is obedience. Only an obedient faith can save. Christ is the Savior, but Christ cannot save him who will not obey. Edward Gibbon 
wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Someone has written this as a lesson from the past. He says, as a final warning for the church in our generation, let us observe what happened to the spirit of New Testament Christianity during the three centuries following the end of the apostolic age. The period between the martyrdom of Paul about 65 AD and the Edict of Milan, 330, uh, 313 AD, covered about 250 years. During these years, the church faced alternate periods of persecution and peace. Persecutions were especially severe in the third century, but even then, there were long decades of peace between the short periods of severe persecution. The persecution served to purify the church, but during the long decades of safety, thousands of pagans entered the church, many of whom were not fully converted to the Spirit of Christ. Thus, Christianity became so strong numerically that it was granted legal recognition by the empire in 313 AD. That's what the Edict of Milan was about. Christianity became strong enough on the one hand to make its adoption by the empire a matter of policy and corrupt enough on the other to rejoice in such adoption. Thus, as the Roman Empire entered the period of decline, the church had lost the spirit of New Testament Christianity and was helpless to rebuild the moral fiber. There were many forces that contributed to the fall of the empire, and one of these was moral decay. And this moral decay is seen in the breakdown of the home, the unfair taxes, the waste of public money, the dishonesty, the vice of the official, slavery, the luxury and dissipation of the upper classes, and the pagan veneer that appeared in Christianity. Edward Gibbon, as I said a moment ago, in his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, wrote this. The decline of Rome was the natural and inevitable effect of immoderate greatness. Prosperity ripened the principle of decay. The story of its ruin is simply is simple and obvious, and, and instead of inquiring why the Roman Empire was destroyed, we should rather be surprised that it had subsisted as long as it did. Now, all of that is to say this. There's a lot of parallels to all of that to America today and even to the church today. And we ask the question, where is the church today? The church is a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Christians are the light of the world. We are to let our light shine. Do our lives reflect the Christ that we represent as his church? How much of the things of the world which inevitably lead to destruction can be found in the church? I believe that Malachi's admonition to Israel is pertinent to us today. We must remember the law, not the law of Moses, but the law of the New Testament. Not only in restoring the church to its original structure and form and worship and all of those things, but also in its spirit, in our faith, in our behavior, in our conduct with one another. How much true spirituality is found among us. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, then we'd encourage you today to obey that part of the New Testament that is, to repent of your sins, to be buried in baptism for the remission of sins, and then that you rise to walk in newness of life. If your faith is not as it should be, not as strong as it should be, we can be of assistance to you as we pray with you and for you, or any other need that you might have. If you'd come as we stand together and sing, we'll be glad to help you.